before i start my presentation i will i will keep to 10 minutes and as my earlier speakers have been uh, reiterating i think there are a few points that faces us all of us today particularly the youth one is uh, if you talk of talk of the youth today uh, who are very internet savvy their information about reality is correct they are aware but their experience is not so you ask them can you do this can you do that can you work with your hands they are very confident they can because they have either seen it on youtube or they have some information that that sort of and this is sort of a, a different problem because when we there's a bunch of people who work with their hands who come up and you know we have 3d printing we have everything that is sort of now going for us but we fail to connect with the material that we are working with and that's increasingly happening because you can't convince them because they have not worked with it but the information they have is right that is one second is about uh, inclusiveness i think this is important right now because we are talking of not only everything being virtual or iot but we have to connect people different rural urban and uh, bring them in into manufacturing itself and that's that's a that's a challenge now if you look at rural areas they are used to working with their hands anything you tell them you know technology doesn't affect them and we are trying to enable or get technology sort of to get them out of uh, poverty or improve their livelihood and things like that urban areas everything is off hand you know you you do it on the comp and then there's something that 3d prints it for you if it doesn't come right you do it again and it goes on and on okay so i i'm not sure where, where this is leading because if you read this book by em foster it's available online 1930 and the book is called machine stops and 1930 he actually spoke of virtual reality he he's talking about a, a conversation between the mother and the uh, son and the sun is saying that and these are all virtual worlds where you everyone lives in a cubicle and you can simulate the sunrise the sunset when you want it what intensity do you want it and the sun wants to talk to the mother and mother he has to fix up an appointment and it's today we call it skype or telecon and this is 1930 okay and uh, the mother, the sun is saying that i want to talk to you and the mother says yeah we fixed up an appointment you can hear me you can see me but then why do you want to meet me and the sun is again telling the mother that see i can hear you but it's not you i can see you but it's not you and the whole story ends with the fact that if if uh, the machine stops is that the punishment is you're thrown out of the system the entire virtual system and then you will see the real sunrise and the real sunset and I, i'm not sure where we are sort of okay then i think as my earlier speakers also pointed out we have to distinguish between prosperity and consumerism both are not the same okay we've had our earlier you know we talk of heritage you know heritage has come about a time when communities have been prosperous and they have devoted their time beyond their regular strife for survival you know food and all that towards arts you know music and things like that okay consumerism consumerism is not equal to prosperity then sustainability in a consumerist society is not going to be possible okay it is just not possible and we should also distinguish between livelihood and lifestyle okay technology to support livelihood is different from technology to support a lifestyle okay so i'll just leave with this and another thing is like you know many of us have been looking at gandhi and all that but if you look at jc kumarappa who's also a gandhian economist way back 1930s 1940s he actually said that sustainable development is something that promotes development without doing any irreparable damage to the environment now he talked of decentralized you know distributed and stuff like that which we are again coming back to but in this notion i'm going to give you some experiences on the sanitation part that we've had and this is unfortunately the tsunami that struck in 2004 and uh, the institute was approached by center for environment education to provide sanitation now this is an island which has very good drinking water at 3 feet 4 feet level they've been living there for hundreds of years they are vulnerable to the coastal tides and uh, when we approached the island we said that okay i mean they are very very scattered very low population and we said just leave them alone why give them sanitation in the first place because the men are fishermen so they go early morning to the coast you know they take off into their boats and go and yes you know i wouldn't i don't uh, i'm not uh, promoting open defecation but uh, the fact is that do they need it in the first place because the men can't come home at 4 am in the morning to use the toilets and then go back with the so we had to target the women and children okay so this is the sort of community that were there and it was an interesting situation because there was some farming activity on the island they had a very high water table there was a risk of tidal waves the area gets flooded during the rains and uh, at the same time they use firewood for cooking 
Now, these are people who also have some houses in the mainland where they have proper toilets. But when they come to the island, they prefer to not have toilets. Okay? So it's not an awareness that is the issue. Many of them have actually been to Singapore, Malaysia and all. Okay? And what we did is that we initially, the first thing that comes up is, okay, let's provide eco sand. Okay? That's dry sanitation using ash. You add that to the pit, it does not contaminate the groundwater. And uh, the fertilizer that comes, you can use it for agriculture. That was sort of systemically fitting in there. We proposed that idea first. And then the community said, nothing doing. We want something like you guys have in the urban areas. We want something that we can flush and then, you know, things like that. So then we said, okay, we have to do something there. So we came up with a thing called, uh, the design called a modified compact septic tank. So it's actually a septic tank, but uh, it performs in a different uh, manner. We just got a patent for this as well. And it's an open patent, as in we've not uh, tried to commercialize it per se, but uh, at least to protect the IP that is coming from the institute. Hmm? Now, what we've done is that with the septic tank, there are two problems. The water that leaches out or the, the wastewater that comes out of the septic tank is not bacteriologically free or it's not pathogen free. At the same time, you can't add acid or any phenyl or any of the disinfectants into the septic tank because it'll create, it'll hinder the microbial activity in the septic tank. So we created a post-filtration chamber that you see here. And this is the ground level. And what we did is that we looked at the evaporation rates in that uh, island in terms of the soil evaporation. And we said that why not dissipate all the moisture close to the surface rather than let the moisture go into the soil where it can it can contaminate the groundwater. And then what we did is that this post filtration chamber you can also is it takes the water leaving the septic tank. We instead of the septic tank being linear, we turned it. And uh, what we what this does is it regulates the water level in the septic tank. I'll come to that point later. At the same time, you can add disinfectants into this part. So the water leaving the septic tank can actually be disinfected before you dissipate it. So we built nearly 140 of these, and this was uh, nearly 2007-2008. And these are just some of the points that I just mentioned. And uh, this is how it is integrated with the community. Most of them have actually adopted it. Uh, particularly the women and children are benefiting the most. And uh, in 2008, there was a Swiss Environment Foundation Award for Clean Water, and they were looking at institutions which promote uh, technologies that, that protect clean water. And we were one of the runner-ups runner -ups for that. And uh, they actually, even the UN uh, cites this as one of the best practices for sanitation in coastal areas. So these are some of the, and this is what I was saying. This is where we found that the, the nutrients on the close to the surface can also be used for the kitchen garden. And this is where I think we were, we were successful in seeing that the design does not contaminate the groundwater. At the same time, that filtration chamber that I said, it has a functionality where if the entire toilet gets flooded during the rains or during a tidal wave, the toilets will resume functionality after the water recedes. Now, this is one functionality that was crucial because what happens with any calamity is that the sanitation gets hit first. And at least with water, we've been able to do something because we can take packaged water and give them anywhere. But in sanitation, you cannot. And when sanitation gets affected, it has a snowballing effect on the calamities and the diseases. So that was one thing that we were able to do. And in terms of manufacturing, what happens is that we, we use the local labor to generate. This is fly ash coming from Navili. This is my colleague's technology, Professor Venkatram Reddy. And here again, we found that skill is a problem today because people find it easier to work in a mall rather than have a skilled job and work hard. Now, there's a big difference here. Okay? And I'll come to that. I think sanitation is a wide range. And this is, this is still practiced in rural China while I was there two years back. And this is in Korea where, you know, if you don't have electricity, you can't use the damn thing. Okay? So, you know, you, you have all the things that you need, but I'm not so sure where the sustainability line is between these two. Now, these are those constructions happening. And I'll also bring in this issue of attitude, which is important. Now, this was constructed by UNICEF uh, toilet for the gents, another parallel toilet for the ladies. And there's a water hand pump here. So you pump water, go use the toilet. Okay? This was done immediately so that people have access to toilets. Now, the thing is that community did not use it. But they use the space in between to defecate in the open. Now, this doesn't make sense, right? And if you look at, I actually surveyed most of the areas which were tsunami affected where toilets were provided. Most of the places where there were toilets provided, they were converted into storing fire roots. Because if I talk to them, they say that 
the toilets don't leak, they are dry, and you know they are ideal places for us to store firewood because we want them dry. And so did our toilet, you know. One of our toilets got converted to a kitchen and the other got converted to have soap kits. Okay. So the thing is that, you know, who are we really providing for? How do you ensure that? Uh, and I will stop with this and uh, there are two other things I wanted to talk to you about with the skill thing is that uh, the, my colleagues and I were meeting together. We worked on this descaling technology called rammed earth. And what we found is that uh, if you want to build toilets or tomorrow my student is going to talk about stoves, you need skilled mason to come and do this for you. So Somshekar, this colleague of mine who has been involved in disseminating stoves, he said that why not have a mold where you use local soil, you use local, you know, get some cement, stabilize the soil and use it to make toilets or stoves. And it worked beautifully. So we can actually have molds now. I, I have not shown that here. But that is something that, you know, you can de-skill, but then if you keep de-skilling everything, where are we heading, you know? So I'll stop with this and thank you.